Let me give you a little bit of a very general overview of the book Tanya and its centrality in the whole thinking of Chabad, and also to give a general summary of what this particular chapter is about. And then we'll do a bit from the inside, and hopefully you'll want to look at it afterwards at your leisure. It's something which uh, this particular study, you can spend a week or a month on it and derive a lot of benefit. The Tanya is the statement of the teaching of Rabbi Shneer Zalman, the first Chabad Rebbe, and the Tanya itself has five parts. The first one speaks about serving God and how a person can attain balance in their life, how we can contend with all of the conflicts which are part of the human experience, and at the same time, to be able to be quote, unquote, happy, to be able to serve God with joy and with inspiration, and it's a, it, it, it goes systematically, that's part one. Part two is a theological statement which explains the continuous creation, the fact that every aspect of creation is continuously being created by God Almighty, and with that, the awareness is the basis of all the teachings of Chabad and all the teachings of Hasidic philosophy. Because once you accept and once you understand how everything is continuously being created by Hashem, you have the key to being joyous, the key to seeing everyone and everything that happens in terms of its inner soul. There's an inner soul to every aspect of creation. The third part is called the letter on teshuva, on repentance, And basically, it speaks about the power of the soul, of the neshama, and the relationship with God, and how a person can have a balanced religious experience and attitude by understanding how we are actually a part of God. Every person has within them a part of Hashem. The fifth part is an exposition of a chapter in Tanya chapter 40, and uh, it was Kabbalistic writings which Rabbi Shneer Zalman wrote at the time that he was um, compiling the first section of Tanya. I skipped out the fourth because that's what we're doing today. The fourth is the only part of Tanya which was not directly written for this purpose in this order by Rabbi Shneer Zalman. It was published in the first time in 1814, which was a year after, or within the year of when Rabbi Shneir Zalman passed away. And it was uh, published by his son and his brothers. He had three sons, and they were the ones that gave it out. And basically, it's letters. It's called Igeres HaKodesh, the holy letter, meaning these are letters which Rabbi Shneir Zalman wrote at different times. And the theme, mostly, is explaining the power that there is in practical mitzvahs, and specifically in the mitzvah of tzedakah, especially the tzedakah of Eretz Yisrael, and why it has such a central place in life, and we're going to talk about that today, and it it contains 32 sections. Today we're going to be doing section 4, it's part 4 of Tanya, section 4, and basically, what it speaks about is the composition of a person and how our emotions and how our feelings are layered in a certain manner. Specifically, he speaks about chitzonius halev, the outer heart, and panimius halev, the inner heart. I mean, the outer heart is not just, uh, you can say, in emotions, you can say that a person loves being able to find employment, being able to find customers or clients or whatever it happens to be that a person is looking for. But that might not be the most inner aspect of their life. They want to find the clients because they want to earn a living. 
what they want to provide, what they want to provide with, with, with the comfort to the families, or they want to give charity, whatever it is, they have a, a, a further goal. So you have layer upon layer. A person gets all excited about uh, who won the election, or disappointed about it, or happy about it, or challenged. But at the end of the day, he goes to work because he has to earn a living. And his health matters to him even more than his business, or certainly his family's health. If, if there's a, God forbid, a crisis of health, we care about it. And life itself, when there's something threatening life, we certainly care about it. So I'd like to suggest that all of this is part of Chitzon Yitzhalev, the outer heart, the outer expression of the emotions. What is the inner heart? The inner heart is the attachment to God, the very essence of the person. And there's a reason why we were given the ability to experience all of these emotions. And the reason is so that we should be able to connect the worlds. We should be able to see how the worlds are aligned, that the physical world and the spiritual world are not two separate worlds, that this physical world can become a dwelling place to God, and the spiritual world can permeate every aspect of this world, and everything that a person does can be used in a proper, in a planned, in the way which has meaning, in a way which fulfills its purpose. That's the, in, the inner heart is what connects the most spiritual with the most physical, and even more than that, that which is beyond the spiritual and the physical, which is Hashem Himself, a part of God is within every one of us. And this relates to that and helps us to be able to make this world what it should be, which is Gula, which is redemption. That's redemption of the world, is when everything will be aligned, we'll be able to see we're not going to escape from this physical world. We don't want to. The greatest blessing is to be able to see within the physical world its spiritual purpose and the godliness that's there in every aspect of existence. So there's the, a big world. It's called in Hasidic teachings the Geula HaKlalit, the general redemption, the redemption of the world, Mashiach. Redemption, fulfillment, alignment, call it what you want. But there's also a microcosm, an olam katan, the small world which is every individual himself or herself. And there is exile and redemption within that world as well. Not only within that world as well, but the key to the redemption of the world is the redemption of the individual. Because every person has the godly aspect within them. That's the pinimius halev, the innermost aspect of their heart. And that innermost aspect of their heart connects every aspect of their life. So that a person is living in harmony. When we say echad, it's not just Hashem echad that we understand that the physical world and the spiritual world are one, but that I, in my own individual life, uh, am able to express the inner purpose of existence in everything that I do, so that that God, that part of God that's within me, to my most external and most superficial so-called activities, are all in alignment, they're all one. That's why we were given the ability to be able to have penim yosalev, to have that point that everything, my whole life, depends on this. That's our relationship with Hashem. However, human nature being what it is, and given the conflicts which the first part of Tanya explains that that's a beautiful thing, that tension is what creates everything, and that's why we're here. Otherwise, we would be angels. We're humans, and we have all the temptations, and we have to make decisions, and various uh, life choices, and because of that, that power of saying everything depends upon this, which is meant to express our innermost soul and our relationship with Hashem, 
That's what's supposed to matter the most. Everything else is important, but it's important in a comparative way. It's important as a means to be able to fulfill our inner purpose. Nevertheless, what normally happens is that that innermost part of our hearts is in exile. What's happening is that we use it for other things. And he explains, particularly, it's used when a person has to make a living. And imagine a, 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 a person for their livelihood has to throw themselves into it completely. Whether a person is at the top of the totem pole or whether a person is just eking out a, a, a living just to be able to give, put bread and water on the table for her family, but it requires a tremendous amount of attention, a tremendous amount of involvement. And people take their innermost self and use it in earning their living. So Rabbi Shneer Zalman says, how do we redeem it? You redeem it through prayer when you daven and you are thinking about who am I really? Who am I deeply? Not just how am I earning my living, but what's me? What's my neshama? which predates my birth and which goes forth into the future after my 180 years are up on this planet. Me, the real essence, the real soul, and how I can connect to what Hashem wants from me and how I can use it in my day-by-day -day life. That is what redemption would be in Davani. And the second way and it's really connected, is through tzedakah. Why? Because when a person earns, and they work hard, and they put all of their concentration and all of their faculties into earning that money, that means that that coin, that money, is a distillation of the innermost spiritual energies that a person has, and by giving it for a mitzvah, particularly for the mitzvah of tzedakah, and particularly for the mitzvah of tzedakah of Eretz Yisrael, through that, we are redeeming. It's an act of redemption. It's poda b'shalom nafshi. He has redeemed my soul with peace. Through the act of tzedakah, a person is redeeming the innermost self, which was used in earning that living. But by the person giving tzedakah, he's saying, it's not just about me, it's about what I'm here for. Me is important because I'm an important person and all my needs are important. But in, 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 in the wider picture, it's why am I here and that's the greatness of the midst of Tzedakah. And the last, the end of, the, uh, of this chapter of, of section four, we'll just perhaps look at a couple of things, but there's something fascinating which Rabbi Shneer Zalman says. And that's why I chose this chapter. It's for the last three lines, really. What he says is that three words, v'hisha amdalanu. He says, this merit of tzedakah, Rabbi Shneir Zalman was not a company director. He actually, he was imprisoned. He, they, they, he had people who were detractors, who saw him and his whole way as a threat. Unfortunately, they were Jewish people. And they denounced him. They denounced him as a traitor to the government. And he was arrested in the year 1796. 1796, he was arrested. He was in prison for 53 days which Hasidim say corresponds to the 53 chapters of the first part of Tanya. And he had to defend, and he was on trial for his life because he was on trial for treason. Now how could anybody find a way to say that Rabbi Shnei Zalman was guilty of treason? So they said he's like a king. He lives like a king. He has young people who are fanatically following him and doing whatever he wants. And the big central accusation was that Russia and Turkey were fighting at that time. 
The Russians and the Turks were at that time in a war and the land of Israel, Palestine, at that time was under the control of the Ottoman Empire of the Turks. And he was sending money to Israel. So the opponents, they said, look at all these, this money that he's sending there. He's sending it to your enemies, the Turks, in order to help them to be able to defeat the Russian army so he can set himself up as a king. That was the accusation, basically. And it was taken seriously. We have today the, all the archives, hundreds and hundreds of pages of evidence were preserved in Petersburg, in Leningrad. And Chabad got copies of this. It's printed today. Um, all of the various documentation, including a seven-page uh, defense of Rabbi Shneer Zalman of himself. And in it, he explains, he says, you say, I live like a king. He says, the clothes that I'm, I was arrested in, those are my clothes. They're pretty simple. They're pretty plain. And he explains how he earns a living. And you can see that he was not... But nevertheless, he raised a lot of money for tzedakah. He raised a tremendous amount of money for building up the Yishuv, the settlement of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And that is what cost him his freedom for 53 days. He was on trial. In, the, in, those, in those documentations, you have actually the signature of the Tsar of the time, who became personally involved and the prosecutor was a bit suspicious. And the Tsar said, let him and the 26 Hasidim who were arrested with him, let them all free, just keep an eye on them. But it was something where the Tsar took personal interest in it. And uh, Rabbi Shneir Zalman had to explain. So this tzedakah was the cause of the threat to his life. And that's why it's so fascinating that at the end of this chapter, when he speaks about tzedakah, and he speaks about how it's a distillation of your inner soul, and how vital it is, and how important it is that we take our possessions and our money and use it to serve God, he ends off by saying, It was this zuchot, it was this merit, the spiritual reward of the tzedakah that I raised for the land of Israel that turned the tides in my favor and freed me. And that's why the day of Yutes Kislev to this day is celebrated because it's not only the victory of a person who lived a couple of hundred years ago, but it's the victory of an idea. It was the vindication of the idea. And what was the zuchos? Giving money to Eretz Yisrael. And it's fascinating because you'd think that that was the problem. And despite that, he was able to be freed because of some other reason. And Rabbi Shneer Zalman says, no, it was the fact that we raised the money for Eretz Yisrael, that was the thing which earned my redemption. And that's relevant in every one of our lives. You learn a chapter of Tanya, the most important part of it is when you finish learning it and you say, how does it talk to me in my situation? And every person in their situation, we all have our own challenges, and we all have our own obligations. We all have our inner purpose of our lives. And in order to do it, we have to grow. And in order to grow, you have to pay a price. Something like tzedakah. Sometimes it's financial. Very often it's not just the financial. It has to do with a paradigm shift within the person to look at things in a different way or to overcome inhibitions, or relationships, or habits, or addictions, all the different things that we have to give up in order to take the next step in our spiritual growth. In today's language you say, leaving your comfort zone. That is the way you grow. And a person sometimes can think, look, that's what I'm here for, that's what God wants me to do. Nebuch. I have no choice. You know what? I'll do it. That's also a pretty good uh, achievement. So the Alter Rebbe is saying here, Rabbi Shneer Zalman is saying here in this chapter of Tanya, you are leaving your comfort zone. You are paying a price to do what you know you should be doing. I don't take it lightly. 
You're paying. You're giving something up. But I want you to know that not only will you be blessed in spite of what you are paying, that in itself will be the blessing that brings you your own inner fulfillment on every level. I mean, I know, I always think of the story of, I heard from a good friend, Rabbi Shalom Lipska in Bell Harbor in Florida. And uh, he talks about somebody who came to a wedding of a very close friend and he was going to be one of the witnesses under the chuppah. But the only thing is that in order to be a witness under the chuppah, you have to be a Shama Shabbat. That's, it is the halacha, because it's, it's not the average type of witness. Just, a witness just says, this is what happened. If I borrow $1,000 from you, I owe you $1,000 irrespective of whether there were witnesses or not. I owe it because I took it, and I have to give it back. What do I need witnesses for? I need witnesses because we might forget, we might move somewhere, we might, someone might deny, of, you know, whatever happens. So it's there to make sure that everyone knows that that's what happened. But the debt was not created by the witnesses. They're only there to give evidence that it happened. Whereas in a marriage, the Talmud learns it's a second type of a witness. The actual event becomes facilitated and becomes achieved through the witnesses. And therefore, they have to be people of Shema Shabbat. So the rabbi explains to this young man, this yapi, and says, you know, it has to be someone, I'm sorry, I know that you, you, you've come here, traveled here specially, but this is the rule. That's why, by the way, in Israel, when they come to make a wedding, there were always two people. The rabbi comes to the kibbutz or to the little moshav, and he comes with an, another person, and that other person is not related to the rabbi or to anyone present. They're going to be the two witnesses. Or you look at the old Ketubot, a hundred years ago, it's the rabbi and the chazan who would sign it. Because you needed two people who were observant Jews, and sometimes it was not always easy to find. So this young man says, and what if I become Shama Shabbat? So uh, the rabbi said, then you would be able to sign. All right, I'm Shama Shabbat. So the rabbi, to his credit, says, not so fast. One minute, he says, uh, do you know what it means to be Shama Shabbat? He said, yeah, you don't use electricity and you don't write, can't go into work, you have to make kiddish, you go to see. He knew he had a pretty good knowledge of it even though he wasn't so observant. So, can I do it? The rabbi, to his credit, says, not so fast. He says, uh, do you know how long is the commitment for? So he says, open-ended commitment. So the rabbi says, think it over for five or ten minutes. Think if that's what you really want to do, because it has to be honest. And five or ten minutes later, he comes back, he says, I thought it over, this is my wedding present. I'm becoming Shema Shabbat. So Rabbi Lipska tells me the story. I was in Florida at a wedding, actually, 15 years ago. And um, I said, when did this happen? He says, seven years ago. I said, where did I now? He says, tell you the truth, he still is an observant Jew. Then I was in Florida again about maybe six or seven years ago, some, you know, some years after then. It was actually a test Kislev, and we're sitting at a Fabrengen. It's three o'clock in the morning, and everyone's singing. And I said to him, to Rabbi Lipska, I said, where's that guy you told me about? He said, I just met him last week, him and someone else in, in a similar position. And he told, and I'll tell you three things about him. Number one, he's still Shema Shabbat. Number two, he's become very, very successful and very wealthy. And number three, he said, Rabbi, it saved my life. So the rabbi said, what do you mean, saved your life? He says, I got a circle. You know, my close circle of friends, 20, 30, whatever it is, all young Jewish yuppies, all people around my age group, all successful to different degrees in, in, in business. He says, and all have soured or destroyed relationships. They're divorced or separated or single or lonely or living in a shell of a, of, of, of a marriage and of a relationship. And I'll tell you what happened. 
This is my lifestyle. Come Saturday morning, get up a bit late, wash the car, go to football, to a ball game or whatever, other, a movie, whatever your uh, interest is. That's, that's the lifestyle that everyone was following. I made a commitment. Nebuch. But I'm an honest person, and when I make a commitment, I keep it. And I figured it's the right thing to do, even though it's going to cost me comfort zone galore for the rest of my life. So i got to go come home early on Friday. I've got to make Kiddush for my family. Saturday morning, I've got to get up at a certain decent hour and take my kids to the synagogue. And we come home and we sit down around the table and we talk and we sing. We argue, but we're talking. We're there. There's a relationship. He said, there's nothing that I have, all of the wealth in the world that I have, that you can compare to the value to me of having that relationship. And when I heard that story, I thought of this chapter of Tanya. It's not, it's, and each person, according to where you're holding, your spiritual journey, life is a journey. But in order to take the next step, you don't have to jump. It's not a good idea to jump. You can get hurt. But you do have to take a step. And when you take the step, the normal thing, but for guys like me, is that what's it going to cost me? What's the least amount I can get away with in keeping whatever it happens to be that I want to take as my next step? And lo and behold, Rabbi Shnei Zalman says, you're talking about personal redemption. shalom nafshi, my soul was redeemed in peace. My soul, it refers to the individual, and the rabbis tell us it refers, as it were, to God's soul, his purpose in creation, because every one of us, every one of us represents a microcosm, all of creation, which is to bring godliness into the world, that happens through each of us in our little corner, each one in his or her own corner, bringing that godliness in. And in order to do it, I have to leave my comfort zone. In order to do that, I'm paying a price. But I'm happy to do it because I'm giving something up for the sake of a greater good. Says Rabbi Shnei Zalman at the end, I want to tell you one thing. You might go through difficult times. He was, life was under threat. He was in prison. But I want to promise you one thing. That which you surrendered, that which you submitted yourself, your emotions, your habits, your addictions, your comforts, your resources, whatever you submitted, and you did it for the greater good, I want to promise you one thing, it's going to be for your good, not only spiritually, but in this world itself. And I once heard from the Rebbe, I just to conclude, I heard from the Rebbe, he spoke about my soul is redeemed in peace. And talking about the microcosm, about the individual. The Rebbe said that in every person, what kind of peace, what kind of war? The whole Tanya is based upon explaining to us the first section, the 53 chapters, the inner struggle, the inner conflict, which is part of human existence. <coughs> and how to become excited and encouraged and challenged by it but not, God forbid, to be depressed by it, to be happy with the fact that we constantly have to be on the beam. There is the side which tells us to do what we know we should do, and there's the side which resists within every person. That's the war. The peace, the shalom, is when a person is able to reconcile and to do what they are supposed to do with their lives and to find a way to be able to fulfill that. And if you want to be at peace with the world outside, the best way, the surest way, and maybe the only way, is by being at peace with the world inside. When a person is able to find a direction in their own personal life between the different pulls that there are, between the different forces, between that tension, 
and is able to go and say, this is what I am, this is where I'm supposed to be, and I have just have to find out how to get there, that leads to the redemption in peace, the inner shalom, the word shalom means peace, it also means shalem, completeness. It means the person is aligned, he's complete, he's redeemed. And then, our relationships with others, with the Jewish people, with humankind at large, with all of the whole universe, is just an- another stage within that spiritual growth. So Hashem should bless us all, that we should be able to think, contemplate upon the thoughts in Igeret HaKodesh, chapter 4, and uh, fulfill our own individual purpose in life, and be a link, and be a force. Every one of us and every one of you is able to be a force towards the fulfillment of the general purpose to be able to bring redemption to the entire world. May we see it in a revealed way very soon indeed.